It is now my honor to introduce Dr. Scott J. Allen. Scott is, spe is a speaker, professor, author, and entrepreneur who empowers people and organization to build stellar leaders. Scott is the Reed Chair in Management at John Carroll University, where he is an associate professor. He teaches courses on leadership, management, executive communication, and the future of work. He's published more than 50 book chapters and peer-reviewed journal articles. He presents at academic conferences and has written four books. His most recent book, Captivation, Online Presentations by Design. Outside his academic endeavors, Scott speaks, consults, coaches leaders, facilitates workshops, and leads retreats across all industries. Please join me in welcoming Scott Allen. Scott, it's great to see you here tonight. Thanks you so much for being with us. Thank you, sir. It's good to be with you. It's good to be very, very good to be with you. And for all of you, you can see that, correct, Eric? We can see it. Okay, great. Uh, for all of you who are here with us, thank you for, uh, I know all of you are pretty awesome people as well, because it's like 730 on a Tuesday night, and you're wanting to talk about disruptive technology. So uh, kindred spirits here, I really, really appreciate you being here. Uh, as Eric said, my name is Scott Allen. I teach in the College of Business. My, my day job is kind of leadership and leadership development. And uh, tonight I'm going to be talking to you and in some ways kind of modeling uh, not my area of expertise. I'm in this active process for the last two or three years of retooling, of learning. And, and maybe some of you are on here tonight to kind of explore some of that space as well. So I am going to start with a quick kind of story. I, I kind of think of, you know, my students in, in this way. When they're my age, that'll be 20 years from now, um, you know, what, what's their life going to be like? About four years ago, I'd kind of come across this study that suggested, and we'll look at the numbers here in just a moment, but the study had suggested that about 47% of jobs were at risk of automation in the next 20 years. So I'm kind of thinking to myself, as I'm looking out at these students who are 21, 22 years old, uh, 20 years from now, they're roughly at the time kind of around my age. They've got young children. They've got jobs. Are these people are we setting them up to be on the cutting edge or are they gonna be on the chopping block? Are they orienting their careers in a way that is gonna keep them relevant over decades so that they can make a difference in their organizations? And I have a bias and this is Scott Allen speaking, this is no one else talking, but I, I have a bias about business schools a little bit. I think we do a great job of looking at the past. Our case studies and our textbooks lock us into the past. I think we do a fairly good job of looking at the present. And I don't think we do really much at all when it comes to what does the future look like? What's coming down the pike? What skills do we need to be in, in really focusing on now? What do we need to make our students aware of now so that they can enter the workforce relevant? And like I said, on that cutting edge. So we kind of have these two tsunamis. We have this kind of COVID-19 tsunami that has shifted the landscape drastically. And then we have this digital tsunami that is going to change the landscape drastically. And actually COVID in many ways has sped up some of this digital transformation. Uh, here we are, right? A year ago, I'd never heard of Zoom. So we're shifting. And in this shift, some really pretty interesting things have been happening. Uh, last year in 2020, I've, if you would, I'd love for you just to go into the chat real quick. And I'd love for you to tell me how many telehealth visits occurred, occurred in 2020. What do you think the number is? How many telehealth visits, that's meeting with your caregiver on an iPad, how many of those occurred across the country in 2020? What do you think? What do you think that number is? Go ahead and put that in the chat if you would. And Eric, could you just tell me some of the numbers that, that, you, that you see kind of coming up as they, as they show up? Uh, 50 million, 125,000, 100,000, um, 34,568, 15 million, 22 million. Uh, what, what I looked up this morning is it was 1 billion. 1 billion. Bitcoin, this little digital currency was at $46,767 this morning. What is that? I mean, you can get a lot of different. So, so there's something kind of interesting happening there. We created a vaccine literally in under a year. 
So this digital revolution, it's 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 shifting the landscape. And I don't care if you agree with it or you think it's ter- we we can't predict the future. All this other stuff. There's shifts that are happening. One billion telehealth visits, and this is happening all over the globe. And I'm going to show you one quick video to kind of introduce this topic tonight. And this is something that's kind of happening in our backyard. So I would love for you to take a look at this video. John Carroll Lam at the helm of Goodyear. This is how they're thinking about the future. Think of what life will be like in the future. Pretty darn incredible that that's even how Goodyear is thinking right now that they are looking ahead. There's an organization in town that we're going to talk a little bit in in the state, I should say, called Ohio X. And they just had a story in their weekly newsletter last week about flying cars that are really kind of being worked on in the Columbus area. So fascinating. Right here in, in, in Columbus, we have some of this stuff being experimented with right now. Flying cars in Columbus. I think it was actually outside of Springfield. And you know what? kind of fascinating, kind of interesting. So this future that we're moving into is a really interesting and fun place to be. I want you to also think about how the fact that really every industry is going to be touched. Now, Eric, can you please let me know if you cannot see my screen? Only if you can't see it. But higher ed, higher ed is, it's, it's in a really, really interesting place in history. Now, I came across this organization literally a week ago. It's called Quantic. Quantic is a um, mobile forward MBA. They are recruiting, and we could go to the website right now. We're going to provide you this link. But they are recruiting men and women from STEM, from Harvard, from Johns Hopkins. They're recruiting men and women from Google, Facebook. It's a $9,600 MBA, all mobile all kind of really you are in control tech elevator another really interesting company in town right here in cleveland tech elevator was founded and this is a really really interesting case study now tech elevator is a three-month boot camp three months i need a high school degree to get in and I mean, obviously they they have standards for you to be accepted i believe there's an interview but you need a high school degree Now they've accepted people with PhDs, people with English degrees, people with master's degrees, but bottom line, I need a high school diploma. For a three month boot camp, $15,000. Now, again, I could ask you in 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 the chat to kind of give me an estimate as to what you think the average starting salary, average starting salary for someone who's a graduate of this tech boot camp, and by the way, it's a 95%, I believe, graduation rate, 92% placement rate. It will provide you with the link to kind of investigate a little further. Sixty thousand dollars, average starting salary, three months, fifteen thousand dollar investment. Uh, these jobs are in demand. And how does John Carroll, how do other institutions like John Carroll, how do we stay relevant when we're competing with Quantic, which really anyone can take from anywhere, and it's a fraction of the cost. And they're boasting students from the best undergraduate institutions in the world and the best organizations in the world. Now, you've got Tech Elevator. That's another kind of entrance into the landscape. And about four years ago, I was speaking at Radford University in Radford, Virginia. Now I was in Christiansburg, that's where I stayed the night for anyone who's been in the, in the neighborhood. And I'm at Starbucks in the morning before my talk. And it was fascinating because I'm sitting there drinking my coffee and this one barista said to another, hey, are you, um, are you still going to Radford? And she said, no, 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 I'm going to ASU now through Starbucks for free. So you have these seismic shifts that are occurring in higher ed also. So everything we talk about, everything we discuss this evening is uh, impacting, I believe, every industry. And again, I'm thinking about my students. I'm thinking about a lot of the leaders that I work with in the community. Are they on the cutting edge or is their organization going to be in the chopping block? And then, of course, I always look at this through the lens of John Carroll and higher education as well. How do we stay relevant? How do we ensure that we take these incredible values that we have as an institution and 
remain relevant out there in the marketplace. So higher ed and any number of other industries that we could talk about, literally you can Google whatever you want to tonight and type in the topic in artificial intelligence, phishing and in artificial intelligence, and you will find someone who's working to make some type of application. So I am excited to share with you a couple statistics and you're gonna get into all kinds of fun, interesting places. I'm kind of a convener when it comes to this topic, but I just said, I'm not a technologist by trade. I'm just a person who says, look, we need to be having these conversations at John Carroll. So for the last two or three years, I've been trying to convene them. And in the process, I've been learning a lot. Uh, this first stat is that study that, that I cited at the beginning of the presentation kind of interesting. And then when you start looking at the numbers from Deloitte and Bain and McKinsey and KPMG and the White House, uh, a picture starts to kind of form that there will be massive shifts. Andrew Yang, who ran for president as a Democrat, and I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, he wrote a book called The War on Normal People. And I would really implore you to get this book. I don't care if you like Democrats or Republicans. I don't care if you like universal basic income, which was kind of his solution. So that's a fun other total different argument we could get into. But he kind of builds the case in the first few chapters of this book where he says things like, look, the, the jobs that are employing the most people in the United States right now, uh, sales associate, customer service rep, call center worker, truck driver, food service prep, uh, each of those is actively working to be disrupted. I was on a call with Trisha Griffiths the other, or earlier tonight, I was listening to uh, North Coast Ventures, their, their annual meeting, and she was talking about trucks platooning. They think that the autonomous vehicles, they're gonna start with trucks because they can platoon across the country. No drivers. So all of this, I kind of wrote this last sentence in a journal article I wrote that was called the cutting edge of the chopping block, right? Uh, I, I think we have to pay attention to this. And as an institution of higher education, we need our alums to be having conversations about this. And we need our students to be having conversations about this. And, you know, it's really difficult because you can kind of get into this doom and gloom scenario or you know, this is yesterday, I believe. I don't see the date on there, but that kind of popped up in my feed that a friend posted on LinkedIn. And, you know, here we're kind of hearing that four out of five companies, you know, are creating new jobs because of artificial intelligence. The numbers out of the Fed and the numbers out of the White House kind of suggest that a certain economic, the mostly middle class, white collar, blue collar jobs are gonna be kind of becoming fewer and fewer and fewer. And if you're gonna be a technologist, you're gonna to go to a boot camp, which might be kind of a modern day trade or a cybersecurity boot camp. 30% of cybersecurity jobs are going unfilled in the United States right now. So those are gonna become these modern day trades that people can go get trained for. And then Highland, Key Bank, Cleveland Clinic, they're gonna to wanna to kind of scoop those people up uh, because they can code. So, you know, you can get into these dystopian conversations about everything we're going to discuss tonight, and then you can get into these much more positive, and I guess I don't, I don't know. I don't know that anyone knows. I think we have to pay attention to it, and I think we have to prep our students, and I think we have to prep our alums and our leaders to have all of this on their radar. Uh, so tonight, I'm going to share with you kind of a little bit on disruption. We're going to talk about what a digital mindset is. It's a, something I've been thinking about that we really need to be training our students and our leaders on. We're going to talk about tech literacy. And tech literacy isn't necessarily that I'm a coder. I don't know that I'm ever going to be a coder. But do I know what artificial intelligence is? And maybe artificial narrow intelligence or artificial general intelligence or deep learning or machine learning? Do I know what those things mean? And do I know how they're being applied in different industries? I think for me, that's tech literacy, because if I'm a leader in an organization right now and I'm doing strategy, if I'm Trisha Griffiths at Progressive right now, she needs to know what platooning is. She needs to know what autonomous vehicles, if Elon Musk gets us to level five, which, you know, you can buy the $10,000 package on the Tesla right now. If he does get us to level five autonomous vehicles, what does that mean for Progressive? 
So strategy, business strategy is aligning up with tech. Technology is no longer this thing that's over here. I just heard the other day a key bank employee tell me that we're a tech company that happens to be in the banking industry. And a friend of mine who is works at Walmart said, we're a tech company that happens to be in retail. That's how they're starting to frame uh, their work. So we're going to talk about tech literacy. We're going to talk a little bit about technologies enabling disruption. So there's probably, I don't know, hundreds, but we're going to talk and look at maybe 20. And I'm just going to very high level give you a sense. And we're, we're going to explore next steps for you. Uh, again, some of you on here right now may be technologists. You really understand artificial intelligence well. I'm not necessarily interested in that space. I, I don't know that John Carroll will ever be the people who are building the sensor. That for me is Case Western Reserve. But are we the institution that is developing graduates that understand how sensors are being deployed, understand how sensor technology works, how it can be applied to smart manufacturing or any number of other, do they understand that there's probably gonna be a trillion connected devices in the coming years? And can they think about the data and the data visualization? Are we developing minds in that way as well? Now, who knows? Maybe we'd get into computer science at a deeper level. We have a seaside degree. Maybe we'd get into engineering. Maybe that would become who we become. But that's the general roadmap that we're going to follow tonight. Love this quote. Kind of fascinating one. And it's a thinker, for me at least. I think it's a fun, interesting way to look at this topic. And when we talk about disruption, you know, to break apart or alter so as to prevent normal expected functioning. I did my dissertation at Kodak. And at the time I did my dissertation, there were still about 25,000 employees there. But uh, digital, which is the technology they invented, uh, really kind of did them in. And interestingly, the week they filed for bankruptcy, Instagram was sold to Facebook for a billion dollars. So you have some of these industries. I'm not picking on Howard Hanna. Howdy Hanna is an alum. But Zillow is actively working to disrupt real estate, actively, quickly, using machine learning, selling homes, disrupting that space. Howard Hanna has to be aware of that and has to be competing in that space. They should be hiring data scientists and programmers right now a lot, right? When I'm with my friends who are at KPMG, we had the global head of innovation speak at John Carroll last fall. I said to him, I met him at a conference at MIT, and I said, I heard you're hiring a lot of more data scientists and, and uh, programmers and, and less accountants. And he says, we are hiring those people all day long. My friend at PwC said that he's a partner. He said, look, we, we put about 800 of our people through a coding boot camp because we were trying to reduce about 5 million hours. Kind of interesting. So what does that mean for our accounting degree? And what do we need to be teaching our accounting students? So if you look at all of these things, I have Marriott here. I think they probably did not weather COVID-19 as well as Airbnb did, I would guess. And you know, I have great respect. Their, their CEO just passed away. He had a beautiful video right as COVID in March to his, to his employees. Beautiful video. But you know what? It's kind of just, I have it here because when my family goes on a trip right now, Marriott would be one of the last things that comes to mind for us. So whether it's television, I mean, when's the last time you said, let's call a yellow cab, <laughs> right? So in every sector, in every space, someone is actively working right now to disrupt calculus, which is a multi-billion dollar industry, and trying to use technology to help them do so. I'm going to show you another video right now. This is a guy named Peter Diamandis. He has what he calls the six Ds of tech disruption. And he has an interesting mind. So I want you to have an awareness of kind of how he's thinking about this. But... Yeah, take a look. Six D's of exponentials, of tech disruption. I want to give you a concept, a framework for thinking about all of these. I call it the six D's of exponentials. The first D is that anything that becomes digitized enters exponential growth. It hops on that computational curve. So what's digitized mean? Well, Medicine is being digitized. Genomics is being digitized. Manufacturing 3D printing is being digitized. Finance is most definitely digitized. 
all of the sensors we're putting out there that are putting out ones and zeros are digitizing our world. We're going into a world of you know, a trillion sensors out there. And when it starts being digitized, it enters a period of deceptive growth, right? That 0 0.01 megapixel camera from Kodak became 0 0.02 megapixels, 0 0.04, 0 0.08, 0 0.016, but it all looked like zero. And in that early period of growth, it's deceptive. And then it becomes disruptive, then it dematerializes, demonetizes, and eventually democratizes. Let me explain what those mean. So when something becomes in a rapid disruptive period of growth, it dematerializes products and services. So like it says here, 20 years later, all of these things now fit in my pocket. Right? I don't carry a TomTom -tom or Garmin GPS on the dashboard of my car. It's now dematerialized into an app on my phone, as has a record collection, as has a two-way video conferencing system, as has a high-resolution video camera, still camera, games, everything. These things have physically dematerialized. So when I'm talking to Fortune 100 CEOs, I'm saying, which of your products or services are going to dematerialize? Because when they do, they become effectively free, and they also demonetize. And demonetization is powerful and dangerous, right? So iTunes demonetized the record store. Skype, I don't use you know, long distance to call my sister in Greece. I'm you know, on Skype. Amazon, the bookstore, Google research libraries, eBay, the local store, and Craigslist decimated the newspaper industry. Right, took the money out of the classifieds, put it back in the consumer's pockets. And the final step here is democratization. Because when something becomes dematerialized and demonetized, it becomes democratized. And here's where the marketplaces explode. So by 2016, there will be a billion handsets in Africa. Who would have thought that one of Google's largest marketplaces in the world for Android would be Africa? And the question is, what other products or services are going to explode into this marketplace? Because here are the numbers in this democratization to so the companies that you're investing in. In fact, the markets we're investing in the future. In fact, where the products and services come for from the future is going to change very rapidly. And so for the financial markets, this is one of the biggest things I don't hear being spoken about. This is world's population. In 2010, we, um, I'm sorry, 2010 roughly, we just crossed the 7 billion mark. This is internet penetration. In 2010, just you know, four years ago, we had just shy of 2 billion people connected online. That number, in the next six years is going from two billion people to at least five billion people. At least. It could well be the entire world with some of the systems that are in the books right now. You've heard just recently about one of Google's, you've heard about Google Loon, you've heard uh, just recently in the Wall Street Journal, uh, the news started breaking about uh, Google's interest in satellite systems. But these are systems that would connect seven billion people. And so what happens when at least three billion new minds come online? These are three billion people who've never bought anything before. They're a brand new generation of consumers, a brand new generation of creators, a brand new generation of inventors. What are they going to design? What are they going to consume? What problems do they have where they live that they're going to solve that's going to create new products or services that are going to flow back to us? And for the financial markets, for me, this represents tens of trillions of dollars not spoken about right now. Not a I'm going to go back to an example that I had shared with you about this quanta, quantic. Now, let me know, Eric, if you cannot see my screen. We have an interesting organization here. They have a free MBA that they advertise. Then they have an executive MBA. And the executive MBA 
is kind of an interesting opportunity. We've got um, 34% women, 32 countries, 81% between 34 and 44. These are people who are starting in management. We have Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook to the top employers who are going, you know, coming to this program. 20% are C-level executives doing this MBA. 50 plus company or countries represented schools. These are where their applicants are from, working where they're working from. A year's experience, 11 plus. Uh, $9,600. She did her degree at Harvard, Imperial London, Google, Agile. Uh, kind of interesting, $9,600 tuition. That is democratizing the MBA, you all. That's, it's, it's it dematerialized it. It's all tech forward. And now it's democratizing it because I can now more likely afford an MBA. I can more likely do the MBA on my timeline because I'm busy and I'm an executive. And I wish I would have gotten one, but I didn't. I started a family. And I also don't want to be in class for two years in a row on Tuesday and Thursday nights. We have to have this on our radar because this is a great example of what Diamandis just said. And it's in our backyard. This is a certified program and it's going to be very interesting to watch it play out. So it's interesting when we get into this conversation and it's a fun conversation because something we have to have on our radar as we're thinking about all of this conversation, these six Ds of tech disruption is what I'm calling the digital mindset. Uh, I believe in organizations of any size, any kind, do you have an organization filled with people with a digital mindset who are thinking like Diamandis is thinking? because that could differentiate you. I'm gonna give you a moment just to take a look at this definition. If we're filled with people who are thinking, how do I create a digital twin of this? How do I digitize this? What could we do? What are the possibilities? How could we add value? How could we remove barriers, create efficiencies? Organizations with people who have digital mindsets, I think it's a fundamental differentiator. Now, here's the really interesting thing. This is one of my favorite kind of concepts from, from business schools. They're called conceptual blocks. And I'm going to take a little bit of a detour and then I'm going to come back. It's going to make a lot of sense. So conceptual blocks. The problem in part is kind of us. Not only do we not at times have a digital mindset and even know that that's an opportunity for us, creating a tech forward MBA, um, you know, Essentially, the problem in part is us because we aren't necessarily thinking the way we need to think. So there's these things called conceptual blocks. Conceptual blocks are rules, they're mental barriers we have in our head that impede our ability to kind of define or solve a problem. They're rules that we construct and they're simply not there. Uh, or uh, then they're often subconscious. We aren't even aware that they're working us. So this love this cartoon because it kind of captures the notion of conceptual blocks beautifully, right? You have these people here, they're working hard, they're pulling the rocks and they completely miss the opportunity or miss seeing the possibilities in what that gentleman's trying to propose, <laughs> right? So I'm going to give you an example of how conceptual blocks work. I'm going to kind of share, what, share a story with you. When you have an answer to the story, Eric, would you kind of monitor the, I would love for you to digitally raise your hand, or you could physically in an analog way, raise your hand as well. But when you have the answer to this, go ahead and just raise your hand if you would. We should be about done. Eric, are you seeing any raised hands? I got one. You got one? Okay. A couple. Chris, Chris, L. Chris, what's your answer? What's the answer to the story? The doctor's his mother. Guess what, everybody? Women can be surgeons. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, the first time I shared that with my wife, she said, don't you ever tell anyone <laughs> that I didn't get that answer. 
And actually there's a second answer. It could be a gay couple, which oftentimes people, you know, a couple people get the, the female surgeon answer. Uh, rarely does someone get the gay couple answer. Well, for some reason, you know, child, man, woman, not man, man, or woman, woman. That's a deep seated, or for some reason in many of our minds back here, like right there, there's a rule. It's subconsciously working how we think that surgeons are men. Fascinating. And I could give you example after example after example of conceptual blocks that are multi-billion dollar missed opportunities. And we're gonna do that right now. I'm gonna give you one quick example of a very simple conceptual block. So I had a rule for the last three winters. I had a rule that it might, when I got home from our walk, I put my wife and I walk every day for about an hour. When I get home, I take off my hat and I put it in the basket. That was my rule. And literally every day I'd go home the next, or I'd come the next day to get my hat and be gone. One of the kids would have grabbed it, taken it somewhere outside, and then it would be placed somewhere else in the house. And every day I found myself kind of frustrated because I couldn't find a hat. Beginning of this winter, I kind of like started just thinking about it for just literally 30 seconds. I said, I am not going to go through this winter not being able to find a hat. And my wife looked at me and said, put it in your coat when we're done. Right? Yes. I had this rule in my head that the hat goes in the basket and I was creating all this problem for myself. Very, very, very simple, elegant, beautiful, haven't lost my hat again, solution. So conceptual blocks, let's take a little deeper look. Before Elon Musk came along, uh, only governments create rockets. That was kind of a rule. Think of how many very smart people never even thought to go into the space because governments are in the space of space. And here comes Elon Musk and kind of, and then, you know, you can get into the whole, we're going to land the rocket because that's the most expensive part. All the innovation that's occurred in space and bringing America back. It's awesome. Electric cars. Think about Elon Musk, what, 15, 20 years ago, trying to raise a little bit of money, cash for his idea of an electric car. Think of the rules people had in their head of what an electric car meant. It certainly wasn't fast. It certainly wasn't sexy. People certainly weren't going to pay 90 grand for it. People certainly weren't going to think of it as autonomous or that it could be upgraded uh, over the air. Yeah, fascinating. People won't buy music, right? Napster came along. Music was digitized. Now, think about this, you all. We can get the world's music for $9.99 a month. Everything. Can you imagine 30 years ago if someone would have said to you, yeah, for like 10 bucks a month, you're going to have access to every album in the world. It's another example of how Diamandis, how his six Ds works. Uh, you don't videotape uh, podcasts. Uh, actually, that first one right there, Apple made billions selling music, 99 cents at a time. Because the conceptual block was you don't sell individual songs, you sell a whole album. They came along, sold individual songs, made billions. You don't videotape podcasts. Joe Rogan, I think about half of his revenue was from YouTube before this $100 million deal with Spotify. AI can't do, artificial intelligence can't do artistic things. Tonight, before bed, Google artificial intelligence movie trailer. And you'll see, uh, you know, AI took a shot at making a movie trailer. Basically, they took Watson, fed it a bunch of samples, then fed it the footage of the film, and uh, they came up with a movie trailer. Kind of interesting. Uh, human, human physicians identify the best course of care. There's some studies coming out now that actually, when you give the AI the data of what's going on with this patient, they're coming up with a better course of care than the human. Uh, they're doing robots. Robots are doing surgery on pigs, pig eyes, better than humans. So kind of interesting. The HIV virus, it's bad. It's terrible. It can't be used for anything good. Well, surgeons are using it not surgeons, but physicians are using it and experimenting with it because, you know, can we take the bad stuff out and put some good stuff in and have it work for us? A billion dollar company will have thousands of employees. Like I said, when Instagram was sold to Facebook, 13 employees. Tesla, vastly fewer employees than GM or Ford. Amazon, fewer employees than the 1.2 million at Walmart. 
fascinating stuff, interesting stuff. So not only is work being digitized, but some of these multi-billion dollar companies, uh, they need fewer people to get that work done. Keyword here is former, right? I think there's one blockbuster left. Remember the days of us Friday night, hoping we'd get that last copy of Patriot Games? Uh, no longer, right? And even the COVID has really pushed the envelope here with new releases now being uh, kind of available stuff that's still in the theater. We paid 20 bucks as a family the other night to watch a still in the theater film. And uh, this, this is a great example of kind of a conceptual block, right? Now, here's some other examples. I'm gonna show you two videos that kind of fascinate me. Talked a little bit about Tesla. Uh, Airbnb, this is an interesting one. How do we create the world's largest lodging company but own no real estate? We just create a platform to connect people with the resource, with people who want the resource. And my family spent a month in uh, Utah in October. We just sheltered in place there, went to national parks on the weekend uh, and stayed in an Airbnb. And people who had what we wanted connected us and we just kind of made that happen. Lyft, Uber, how do we create the world's largest people moving service and own no vehicles? So you have these new business models that are being formed that have a lot of opportunity. Now I'm gonna show you two videos. I told you before that, that two of the most popular jobs in the United States right now are kind of food service prep worker and sales associate. So we're gonna look at this. And what I want you to do is I just want you to think about what this means for America. What does this mean? What do these videos tell us about the future? So we're gonna watch two videos. I'm gonna pull them up. This first one's called Amazon Go. Now, many of you know that Amazon owns Whole Foods. So I wanna want you to imagine a future where Whole Foods has this technology and then Walmart quickly needs to, and then Kroger, and then your favorite, for those of you from New York, Wegmans will get this and think about what the ramifications and the ripple effects of this technology. Now, for any of you who've been in a CVS or a Walgreens lately, this would be awesome. Like the best, I'd go here over the place with the person where I had to wait in line. But there's ripple effects and ramifications. So take a look. Four years ago, we started to wonder. It's coming and it's going to be awesome and there's gonna be an impact because of it. So we've got Amazon Go. Now this next one is a story of a company. This is actually four MIT grads who wanted to start a restaurant. Now, when you're starting a restaurant, the chef can be one of the most difficult parts. It's the most expensive, sometimes the most unreliable, a lot of cost involved in the chef. So they decided to digitize, automate the process. They hired a, four-star chef to make the recipes once, and then they automated it. So again, when you think about food service and prep, when you think about some of the future of work, and what's interesting here is that they can reduce their price point too. So these bowls in Boston are about $8. So take a look at this one. So the future we're moving into is a really fun, interesting, scary, worrisome, awesome place. It's all of those. And we need to have eyes wide open. We need employees. We need leaders. We need students who are tech literate. Just a general understanding. Functions, benefits, limitations, ethical considerations. That's a big one strategic value of various technologies and an organization filled with people with a digital mindset and who have that tech literacy uh, might kind of more likely move past some of the conceptual blocks that are going to constrain how we think about the future, that are going to constrain our ability to thrive, constrain our ability to stay relevant. So when you start to kind of look at these, the, these players 
It's interesting. It's a really fun, interesting place. Tomorrow night, we have Charlie Lougheed speaking at John Carroll on Zoom like this. And he's using blockchain technology in a very, very fascinating way. But you have all of these technologies and then what's happening and what's really, really cool and what's interesting, whether it's extended reality, which is augmented or virtual reality, additive manufacturing, quantum computing, nanotech, renewable energy. I saw Ryan Franks on tonight. Ryan is very into energy storage and an expert in that space cybersecurity, internet of things. And there's overlap with a lot of these, but unmanned aircraft systems, what's happening is that all of these technologies are kind of converging. And it's creating all of these very, very interesting business models that again, uh, present themselves as opportunities once we see it that way. Tesla is most likely just as much of a data company as it is anything else. It's basically a battery with a computer shaped like a car on wheels. And there's really interesting, fun things happening. Think about electricity for a moment. Back in the day, and I think of artificial intelligence and sensor technology as almost like the electricity of our era. When electricity came on the scene, everything that could be plugged in and electrified was washing machines, dishwashers, all of that was manual labor before that. But think of all of the possibilities that presented themselves once we could plug something in. Same thing exists right now with artificial intelligence. Someone gave me a gift last year that was a smart mug. A $120 coffee mug is a gift for speaking at their organization. I haven't pulled it. I haven't needed it. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't pulled it out of the box yet. But anything that can be connected, whether it's your golf balls, your basketball, your house security system, every, anything that can be connected is going to be connected. And so there's going to be all these opportunities that start to present themselves in very, very interesting ways. And I'm gonna share with you one. We have, we have a gentleman who is the COO of this organization speaking at John Carroll this spring. Really, really interesting, interesting organization doing um, incredible work. Uh, synthetic organisms built by robots and artificial intelligence. Synthetic organisms, synthetic organisms built by robots and artificial intelligence. Um, and this kind of says it. Niels is going to share with us kind of what some of their adventures have been but they're doing very, very interesting things in that space. So we're gonna wind down. We're almost at our time for the night. I'm gonna reshare my screen and I just have a couple more things and then maybe we'll go to some Q and A. Bob Valente, are you on, sir? I thought I saw you. Yes, are you I'm on, here. sir? I am here. Okay. Bob has spent the last two years attending my classes, especially in the spring. He was with us at Goodyear. He was with us when Charlie Lougheed spoke last. Uh, Bob is putting himself in situations where he's learning. Bob, you didn't go to school for blockchain back in the day at John Carroll, did you? Was that your degree, Bob? Blockchain and sensor technology? No, it wasn't blockchain. It was like putting out Lincoln logs, I think it was. <laughs> So there's a number. So I, first of all, I want to commend Bob because he's awesome. And he's, he's really putting himself in these situations like, like I've tried to do, where we, we are learning. There's kind of a perception, I think, at times that a professor has to sit at the front of the room and profess, well, no, we're going to go to these companies, Goodyear. We're going to go to uh, Technology House. We're going to go to Amazon's 1 million square foot distribution center or Gojo, who's doing fascinating things with sensor technology, Internet of Things on their you know, dispensers and hospitals. We're going to go there and we're going to learn and we're going to explore. 
So there's a lot of resources that you can start to kind of expose yourself to that can help you learn. And I don't think this is going to be something where you're just going to dive in and learn all the stuff you need to know in six months. For me, I've kind of set it up so that I'm getting a few newsletters every week, sometimes daily. I'm listening to some podcasts. I'm getting involved with Ohio X so I have a better understanding of what's happening right here in Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland the three big C's, but of course, Dayton and Toledo and Youngstown has some really cool, interesting things going on as well in other parts of the state. But we're going to share with you some of this uh, links to a lot of these, these resources where you can learn a little bit more because everything, especially if you're new to this, I know firsthand it feels daunting. Like I have no clue what a digital twin is. What would, it, what would that say? What was that thing? I mean, what, what is he talking about? A digital twin. Huh, or self-healing concrete? What, what would that look like? So the first step for me is just micro learning, setting up a little bit of a system where you're getting some data every day and just starting to really kind of learn the space. And then the second step is what I believe Bob has been doing. He's been doing both of these, uh, kind of running in the circles, putting himself in the room and learning. We had a gentleman from Microsoft speak in my class about three weeks ago. I understood 60% of what he said. But that was more than I did the last time I saw him speak. So I'm getting better. I'm learning, right? So tonight, we talked a little bit about disruption. We talked a little bit about having a digital mindset, the benefits of that, the benefits of tech literacy. Uh, sometimes we can be the biggest challenge because we can't think past in new ways about how to do our work fundamentally different. Uh, technology, technology is enabling disruption. There's a number of them and they're converging. We've got the Tesla vehicle that has the sensors that is utilizing 5G that is going to the cloud that the AI is performing analytics on, whatever, you know, all of those things are converging and all of a sudden new opportunities are being created. And then we talked a couple next steps. Love this quote by good old, we will look back for this quote because that's some Drucker. And that's how you can stay in touch with me if you'd like to have a conversation. Eric, we are at 828, two minutes to spare. Perfect. And all of these good people are still on learning about technologies enabling disruption and Amazon <laughs> Go, stuff like that. Well, Scott, thank you so much for sharing with us today. The, you know, I know when we talked about this, you know, it's fascinating and I, I learned even more. Um, and I'm sure all of our alums did. So if, if you have questions for Scott, feel free to, uh, drop them into the chat box and I'll go ahead and um, ask Scott. But um, one question that came to my mind, Scott, is, you know, being in higher education and we're obviously all associated with the university. Um, you know, what does, what does the modern university look like in maybe 10, 15 years? Is it all going to be, will there be like an on-campus experience that we all, you know, enjoyed at, you know, whatever, you know, John Carroll or where we all went to school? Yeah. I, I would answer that in a couple of different ways. Obviously, Eric, I don't know the answer. I was speaking with a friend from Nestle. And I said to him, he was, we, we were talking about some of their product lines. And Nestle had this assumption that if they made a bunch of kind of really healthy food, that would really increase their business. And kind of what they found is they just need to have a spectrum. They need to have the really, really unhealthy lasagna that especially during COVID is really sold well and is not good for you. And that product will sell. And then they need to have everything kind of across the spectrum for those consumers who want something that's more healthy and something that's more kind of conscious of diet. Do they have that product? So what's interesting for me is I think we should probably think about diversifying our experiences. There always will be a faction of students who want the on-campus right here, right now experience. But I think we have been a little bit hamstrung in recent years that maybe we didn't have an online option for busy young, those, remember those age ranges for those students who are going to Quantic? It's like 30, 30, whatever it was, 32 to 43 that want an MBA. We have nothing in that space that is that user-friendly and that mobile and that kind of uh, beneficial for that stage. 
So for me, it's about this really cool opportunity of how do we offer a few different experiences of high quality. And if the student wants to be in the classroom and learn, because that's how they best engage, great. You know what, I've sat on airplanes with people who are our demographic for the MBA. And they said, yeah, I'm going to OU because it's, you know, I can I travel and it's, it's online and I can attend class. This quantic thing, now I don't even have to be online. I'm just doing all of the modules. It's almost like a self-study as I'm understanding it. You have some group projects and, but you know, that's, that's the reality. So I think we have to diversify both what we're offering as degrees are they relevant? Are people getting jobs? Again, Tech Elevator, three months, 15 grand, $60,000 average starting salary. That's not everything, but that's an important data point for us to be aware of and have our eye on. Eric, does that answer your question at all? It does. I, I think another way of thinking about it, Eric, is I, I had the honor of speaking before Chris Gorman. No, yeah, Chris Gorman at Key Bank before him once. So I got to stick around and kind of hear his talk. And it was interesting because they had just done the first Niagara um, acquisition. So that was really kind of the, on the minds of a lot of the people in the room. And this is before he was CEO, but he was in charge of leading that project. And someone asked the question, they said, are we going to, so now that we've got the Northeast, are we going to kind of increase our footprint into the Southeast and blah, blah, blah. And and he said something really interesting. He said, you know, I don't know that it's at this point about us increasing footprint as it is about customer base. Hmm. Like we don't have to necessarily have a branch in Indianapolis to grow our business. I think that's been the traditional mindset, but can we, is it possible to go to Indianapolis and build a beautiful customer base without the brick and mortar? That'd be interesting, you know? So he's thinking about it differently than maybe kind of what traditionally we would be thinking about as banking. One billion telehealth visits. One billion. I was two of those one billion. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sean Freeman had a question. Uh, technology has, uh, one second. Technology has brought more information to our fingertips than any other uh, time in human history. If everything becomes a type of smart object, how will we function as people with all this information to process? How does this information impact us as humans? Yes. <laughs> Sean, is it the Sean Freeman that I know? Sean Freeman, that's an unfair question. Sean, it, it'll, 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 there will be unintended consequences. There will be downsides. There will be upsides. You, you got, there will be ethical, so many ethical challenges with kind of what's happening with our data. You know, these companies know when we come in and out of our house, Alexa's listening to our conversations. Netflix knows what I'm watching. My phone knows where I am. You know, so it's really, really interesting. We're, we're consuming and we're allowing it. We're consuming and in some cases, it's free, giving Facebook all of our data and our phone numbers and who we're related to and what we like and all that information for free. So there's incredible downsides. And you get into issues around ethics and you get into issues around privacy and you get into issues around human connectivity, right? Mm -hmm. So this conversation, artificial intelligence, you can go so many different, very interesting directions. So I think like anything else, as parents, our kids, they have an hour of iPad time a day. And my son, he's out here right now. He's got two hours of Xbox a day. If he's been outside for two hours and if he's done his homework. So in my mind, it's all about moderation and balance. And in places it's gonna to be totally out of balance and abused. And in some places it's gonna be in balance. And in some places it'll be toxic. And in some places it will be beneficial. Does that make sense? I think it does. Yeah, I definitely think it does. I mean, you um, you can just see, you know, even just as people walk across past, past each other on campus, well, when we were on campus or, yeah. you know, people, at least at John Carroll still say hello and whatnot. A lot of places, they just kind of like ghost, like ships in the night, they just pass each other without really recognizing each other. And I, yep. it's probably some sort of impact of technology. Yeah. Um, Kim Doherty asks, are there disciplines at John Carroll uh, that are on the visionary and the cutting edge 
um, and looking forward towards like a future, you know, the future society. Yeah. So I think we have a, we have some, some stuff around data analytics that's coming online. We have computer science. We have, um, you know, I know accounting with the gift from Rich Kramer, the Kramer school. Um, it's, it's really spurred a lot of thinking and creativity about what we do to service that side so that our accountants are graduating with relevant knowledge. So it's happening. Those conversations are occurring. Um, I would always love them to happen more rapidly. Again, if 30% of cybersecurity jobs are going unfilled, there's an opportunity there. Not only an opportunity to help society, they didn't know that that was going to be a thing 40 years ago, 60 years ago, 100 years ago, but we could help society help our students tap into a really great career that is going nowhere for some time because it's going to be a relevant issue. And are we thinking that way? Are we staying on that cutting edge? And in reality, we have a number of alums in that space who could help us create that degree. So Terry Lewandowski asked a really good question um, about how we're how John Carroll's educating its students um, to be digitally minded. Um, and as we go towards democratization of more technology, we don't necessarily leave behind segments of our, you know, our community. So the poor, the elderly, the less educated. How are we as a university kind of wrestling with the ethical aspects of you know, in, in, you know, ever increasing technological world. Yeah. Well, even if you look at what happened with the Cleveland schools as things were kind of shutting down last spring and that, that digital divide. So that's another branch of this whole conversation around ethics. And we could, we could look at rural communities and we could look at urban communities and I'm, I'm generalizing. I, I would say we could look at it as a, um, and this is what Andrew Yang talks a lot about is, is the middle class going to shrink? And what happens then in communities where, whether it's Marietta, Ohio, or East Cleveland, what happens in communities where opportunities, hope, purpose decrease? And it's oftentimes not good. I don't, I don't know that it's a good thing. My grandfather grew up in Fort Dodge, Iowa, and worked at Hormel, had, didn't have a high school education, but became an electrician and died with $300,000 in the bank and had a good life. And now in Fort Dodge, you work at one of the two prisons, the hospital or the Walmart. Those are the largest employers, that's the game in town. So for me, that's a major, major challenge that we face as a country. I don't, this is me, it was Scott opinion. How does the U.S., it's just an interesting thought experiment. How does the U.S. work without a strong middle class? It doesn't. That's a, that I, I struggle with that. I don't, I don't know how. And so that question, I don't have an answer, but it's a very, very important question because uh, we have to hold on to a strong middle class um, for us to function in, in, in my somewhat uneducated on that topic opinion. Now, Tesla, or um, I forget the name of the company that Elon Musk's Starlink, maybe it's called. Basically, they're putting 7,000 satellites around Earth right now. They've already deployed a number of them. Ohio, this is a great reason to kind of subscribe to Ohio X, their newsletter. It's a great newsletter. But Ohio apparently is going to be one of the first spots where basically everyone would have access to internet through Starlink. So you can get rid of Comcast or Time Warner or whoever we have now. I don't even know who we have, but Spectrum. You can, and, and you could get the, your Wi-Fi from these satellites that they're putting up all around the globe. So that again is what Diamandis was saying. Like it's going to connect everybody. And when everyone's online, you know, so I think the interesting thing is the ethics of all of this is far, far, far behind the legislation. Um, the, the ethics and the legislation are far behind the technology. And the technology is barreling forward. You have people at Harvard trying to cure death. You have this company in California where Niels is coming from. They're doing all kinds of interesting things with synthetic biology. You have people doing a lot of stuff. The legislation and the ethics are far behind, which is scary. It is. Yeah, it's 
definitely interesting to grapple with, right? Yep. Uh, we'll ask one last question, and then I, I'll have some announcements. And then Scott's been uh, gracious enough to stay on uh, till about nine o'clock, and I can open up the the uh, the mute so people can ask questions if they wish. Um, last question from Steve Bidoto: What do you think will happen with the teaching profession um, at all levels, so K twelve, higher ed, uh, as we move to an ever increasing techn technological society? Yeah. There's a really cool TED talk. This is kind of not totally answering it, Steve, but I'll get there. But there's a really cool TED talk. He's a professor at Georgia Tech, I believe. They, they created an AI graduate assistant. And the students knew that they had a grad assistant and this was their, their, their grad assistant. And the AI got the highest ratings at the end of the semester because the AI responded to emails quickly. The AI uh, was always helpful, pleasant. You know, the AI, the chatbot is basically what it was, was awesome and got the highest ratings of all of the teaching assistants. Could we digitize my work? Yes. Could we create a university where we have the best mind, Stephen Hawking, you know, who, whatever you want to do. Obviously, Stephen Hawking isn't a, a possibility right now, but you create the best minds in the world and they teach the course, the one course, and we create a university based on that model. That'd be interesting. Calculus, like I said, is a multi-billion dollar industry. When you look at it through the lens of an industry, I never thought of it this way, but there's a guy named Professor Scott Galloway and he's at NYU, he's a marketing guy. And he's really, he does a lot in the space of disruption in higher education. Wrote a very controversial blog post called USS University last summer. Controversial because I think some of it was true, but it was very controversial in some academic circles because he started naming names of who was at risk as far as institutions go. USS University, look it up. But I think for sure, certain elements of my work could be digitized, could be outsourced. We've learned that I don't, I mean, look at Quantic University. I don't know that they have faculty. I think they had like that chef, world-class faculty designed the curriculum. I think if you look at their website, that's what they say. World-class faculty designed the curriculum and then you consume it. Just like we had a world-class chef create the meal and then you eat it and it's the same every time. So there's consistency, it's cheaper, it's awesome because it was designed by a world-class chef and it's cutting edge. So this Quantic University, you can take three courses on blockchain. You look at their electives, they're all like cutting edge, really, really good topics. Fascinating. So do I think the teaching profession? Yeah. Is, as AI gets smarter and I start, just look at your children on their technology and the gamification of some of the things that they're working on. And all of that is big business. If we can disrupt higher ed, it's big business. And that's what Quantic is doing. That's exactly what they're doing. 9,600 bucks. Yeah, I could do that. You can do that. Um, so I think we are at risk. Well, thank you again, Scott, for taking some time this evening to, to be with us and share um, your thoughts on disruptive technologies and your expertise. We are incredibly grateful that you spent time with us this evening, but even more so that you're at John Carroll teaching our students um, how to be ethical thinkers and leaders as we move towards um, a more technological society. <laughs> whatever it is we're moving towards. Whatever we're, whatever we're moving towards. But that's the cool thing too. Like how do we, how do you design a Quantic that has that, but then has, has a Jesuit, you know, the experience reflect, act, evaluate, how, the Ignatian pedagogy baked into the experience. I think it's a really cool opportunity also. So it's scary. But I think for a time we would be offering the whole spectrum or that that would be the opportunity for us. Yeah, we, that would be fascinating for sure. Mm -hmm. um, well, before we get into more of the open session, uh, I want to give you all a couple updates on areas that you can continue to connect with John Carroll. Um, so our next uh, program is on March 10th. Uh, it is going to be our next alumni author series and it features Jake Karisic who is a member of the class of 2006. He will share his book uh, on the Shenley experiment, 
which focuses on Pittsburgh's first public high school. The Shenley School was a social incubator in a largely segregated city and that was highly, even improbably successful uh, through its 160, 156 year experience. Um, for those interested in the history of Pittsburgh or education in general, it should be a pretty fascinating program. On Tuesday, March 16th, you're invited to join us for the last lecture of John McBratney, PhD. Dr. McBratney has been a professor at John Carroll for nearly 35 years, and he specializes in the Victorian literature and colonial and post-colonial literature. McBratney is a beloved member of our community, and we're fortunate that he's willing to share his parting words of wisdom with the larger JCU alumni community. On Thursday, March 25th, Anthony Finelli from the class of 2006 will be featured in another session of the Alumni Author Series. Finelli has found success in front of the camera, as well as behind as an actor, writer, editor, director, and producer. And this program will focus on his journey from John Carroll to the entertainment industry. His recent credits include This Is Us, SWAT, and The Rebooted Party of Five. Finally, please mark your calendar for this year's Founders Day celebration. It will look a little different than in previous years, as this year, like every other one of our programs, we'll be hosting the celebration on Zoom. We're incredibly fortunate, however, to have uh, Timothy, Father Timothy Kosicki from the Society of Jesus as our featured speaker. Father Kosicki is the president of the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States of America. For or, more information on these programs and recordings to all of our previous programs, they can be found on our website at jcu.edu backslash alumni or visit our YouTube channel and search John Carroll University Alumni. Finally, before you can uh, before you leave, please consider a gift to uh, John Carroll University in support of our students, our outstanding faculty like Dr. Allen and our entire campus community. If you've already made a gift this year, thank you for your generosity. If you have not, please join me in supporting JCU so that we can continue to deliver outstanding education for our current and future blue streaks. You can make a gift by visiting jcu.edu backslash give. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Take care, be well, stay safe, and onward on John Carroll.